Hello everyone, welcome to the MS-DOS project. Well, it has finally come. After about a year, two moves, a restart on new, or should I say older hardware, and lots of life changes, I finally completed Ultima 6 The False Prophet. I know a lot of you have been awaiting this, and I'm very happy to give you all my full retrospective and review of this game. Since the late 1970s, Richard Gere has been developing and iterating games for the Apple II, probably the first widely adopted personal computer based on the 8-bit 6502 CPU. For the better portion of the 1980s, the Apple II remained a top platform for PC games. The IBM PC was initially seen as clunky and unsuitable for gaming, as it was primarily a business machine with tough to develop for architecture. This quickly changed, however, as Video Graphics Array VGA, was developed and released, and Adlib and Sound Blaster cards began to appear at a similar time in the late 80s. Despite what the Gary 8 brothers at Origin may have wanted, the Apple II was quickly aging itself out of the market. Not only were the Commodore 64 and other competitors more user-friendly, home consoles quickly becoming a household staple, and even Apple II shipping with 16-bit CPUs at that point, the death of the platform was imminent. Unfortunately for Origin, by the time they saw the writing on the walls, Ultima 6 for the Apple II had already been in development for over 6 months. To make matters worse, the large majority of their main development team was only really experienced in development for the Apple II and similar 6502 based machines, such as the Commodore 64. While they had some staff on board that had experience with ports to IBM PC and DOS, it would not be enough to develop a game, and the company could not afford to delay the game very long to compensate. Robert estimated that it would take over $2 million to hire the new staff, buy the new equipment, and finish the game in the next year and a half for release in early 1990. Although they did not really have that sort of cash on hand, as none of their games had sold enough to make even a million dollars, they decided they were willing to risk everything they had to keep the company and project afloat. This included massive loans and taking out a mortgage on the Britannian Manor, which is Richard's house. Only time would tell if this would play off, but even that time was very little and quickly running out. All of this would lead to a quick pivot to the PC as the main development platform for Origin going forward, with any other platform merely being an afterthought for ports. As part of this pivot away from the old ways Origin had done things, there were several departures, new additions, and large changes of roles and locations of many of the staff. Ken Arnold, who had been there from the beginning, left for Dell, while Dallas Snell moved from a programming role to an executive one. Many of the team primarily were responsible for ports of Origin titles moved from New Hampshire to Austin to take part in primary development. Another big shift came with a man named Warren Spector coming to Origin. He thought it would be wise to start to try to bring some of the principles of the film industry he had worked in to games by creating a more real hierarchy and division of roles. This proved to be wise, as games over the next decade would become a much more complicated and expensive endeavor. As one of the first games developed this way, and the first for PC, solely by Origin, the division of roles was not so clear. Artists were often the ones who had developed the tools for graphics to be used in the game, and musicians were those who knew how to program the Sound Blaster and Adlet cards, etc. Of course, one of the main caveats of the PC that had kept Origin from jumping on earlier was how varied the hardware configurations could be from user to user, and how funky the DOS operating system really was. Even on the Apple II, the music had been catered to those users who had expensive Mockingbird sound cards. It seemed in front of them there was two ways to go with development. Either A, try to cater to as large an audience as possible by including options for as many hardware configurations as possible, but also seriously limiting the capabilities of the new engine, or B, developing for the cutting edge hardware in the hope of selling the game by pushing the limits and impressing with graphics and sound. Origin very wisely opted for the latter, supporting only the new VGA standard and modern sound options on PC in the hopes that this would make the first Ultima made for PC a groundbreaking hit. All of these factors combined made this the most ambitious Origin production to date. The engine that had been iterated on since Ultima 1 was essentially canned. The team wanted to push it even further, with an even more sophisticated keyword dialogue system and portraits that would bring the small sprites of NPCs even more to life. These portraits, over 200 of them, had to be drawn up in a hurry, with the several staff members in charge of them having to create six per day. Staff reached out to whoever they could to be subject for them. Amidst all these newfound troubles with x86 assembly, new staff, new languages, IBM architecture, the company was about a month off of bankruptcy at any given moment. The Garriots held back enough capital to pay the staff for a month in case of bankruptcy so they could go and find new jobs, but they didn't tell them. So everyone but Richard and Robert assume that if they didn't release Ultima 6 by the March 1st, 1990 deadline, the company would go bankrupt. In a feat comparable to Bungie putting out Halo 2 in effectively six months, the deadline was met and the product went to print in March. Of course, as is usually the case, just because the product is shipping does not mean that it's problem free. In 1990, hard drives were still an emerging and very expensive accessory for PCs. And as such, most software was still run primarily from floppy disks. 
The computers used for development and initial testing, however, were equipped with them, and thus it did not become apparent until after copies started to be shipped out and played by users that if the game was played solely from floppy disk, it simply would not work and save as intended. This was all really too late to do anything, and it seemed that this may finally be the thing to sink Origin. Luckily for Richard Garriott and the whole Origin team, the decision to develop for cutting-edge hardware paid off in this respect, as many of the people who bought the game and had the high-end hardware to run it also had hard drives as well. Tragedy averted, it seemed. Against all odds, Ultima 6 released for IBM PC on June 1st, 1990. The game sold incredibly well, over 200,000 units worth. This was enough to save Origin from bankruptcy and help them survive into the next decade. In addition to PC release, there was a significantly pared down Commodore 64 that somehow ran. Not recommended. One of the most interesting and bizarre ports, however, is for the Japanese FM Towns computer. Because the FM Towns use CDs very early on, it has fully voiced dialogue both in English and Japanese which may make this the first ever game with fully voiced dialogue. Tis good to see thee again. Much hath happened since thou last departed our realm. Take this key. It will unlock the gatehouse by the southern entrance to the castle. There was also an SNES port released several years later, which I will likely cover in a later Ultima Console Ports video. As part of release, the Origin team brought the usual excellence to the physical product. The first thing you notice is the Dennis Lupe cover art of the Avatar standing over some kind of demon, which I'm sure did not help the legend of Ultima games being demonic to parents everywhere. And of course there's the game on several floppy disks, an amazing cloth map as per normal, as well as this awesome compendium manual and a small stone representative of an orb of the moons, an item very important within the game itself and its plot. In addition to the normal registration reference materials, the original box included a postcard for the quote immortality contest, where several lucky winners would get included as NPCs in the next Ultima game. Ten boxes also contained a small rune that guaranteed a win in this contest, but it appears that most of these were not claimed by those who received them. Many of those lucky winners did appear in Ultima 7, which I think is a really neat beat of trivia, but also a great example of a developer giving back to their dedicated fans. The installation process for the game on DOS is pretty straightforward, giving the option of a few different sound cards or the Roland MT32 for music, and a location for where to install it. Of course, most players these days will just want to use a modern computer, for which GOG is the go-to place to get the game. They wrap it in a nice DOS box launcher that makes it straightforward to just click on, boot up, and play. There's also an engine remake, in Nuvi, which while not perfect, does introduce some quality of life changes that may interest those turned off by the interface. On boot up you'll get this pretty awesome intro. It goes mostly as follows. You, the avatar, are sitting on your couch on earth watching TV, flipping through the channels, you know, waiting for a call from Britannia as always. Outside it starts to rain, lightning strikes in that circle of stones where the moon gate has appeared before. You run out and you find this small little rock. Now you pick it up, and a moon gate appears, but the moon gate is red, which is really concerning. But the moon gate starts to disappear, and you don't really have time to think about it, you just jump through. Well, you jump through and you're not in Britannia. You're in some weird foreign plane, and all of a sudden, you see demons surround you, grab you, and put you on a sacrificial slab. You think this will be the end for the Avatar, as the head demon priest guy opens a book and pulls out a knife, and all of a sudden, he's dead. Your three companions, Shamino, Yolo, and Dupre, come through Moon Gate to save the day. Having killed the head demon, they grab you and run through the Moon Gate, but a few follow before it closes. After this pretty wild ride, you are dropped onto the main menu. The first option just replays the introduction, and the next one brings you into the standard Ultima character creation, asking for your name, gender, an option of several portraits, and putting you through the standard rune question test. Of course, you can also choose to transfer over a character from Ultima 6, but I ended up not being able to do this as I opted to play through the game on my 486 machine, and I'd played all the previous ones on my modern Windows laptop. You will receive the usual stat and level reduction, but it'll definitely pay off to get that initial head start, as leveling can be a bit of a grind. The other two options give you brief development credits, and Journey Onward gives you the ability to load from your last save. When you finally load into the game, you start out immediately in a combat sequence. Several of those demon creatures seem to have followed you through the moon gate and right into the throne room of Lord British. 
Oh, but of course, he wouldn't dare lift a finger to help you, no. He just sits there on his throne and probably sends you the bill for the bloodstains on the carpet. Anyways, you just got dropped into the semi-new combat system. If you've played Ultima 3, 4, or 5, this system will seem somewhat familiar to you. In the old system format, each combatant gets a turn to move or attack, sometimes several depending on the character's dexterity. Differently from the old system, you are not locked into combat until you either leave the area or defeat the enemies. You get to choose when to enter your party into combat or leave it, and that can be used to advantage some time to run past situations you don't want to fight at on. You also are no longer required to control each of your party members' actions either, but instead you can give each of your companions a battle strategy that they will vaguely try to follow, from head first assault to flanking and straight up retreat for weak members of your party. You also still have the option to control the ones you want manually if you would like to, which can be useful if you want to control two or three characters for easy leveling. Once you've defeated these demonic looking creatures, you'll want to go have a chat with Lord British. And the very first thing he does is grill you on the compendium manual. They are all very easy and to answer questions if you have it on hand, but this was intended as copy protection, so that only people who had a legit copy could get past the beginning of the game. Of course, nowadays these are easily findable on Google, so it shouldn't give anyone too much trouble. If you fail it, you can't progress out in the game, but that shouldn't be much of an issue these days. The new conversation system is awesome too, with characters having a ton more to say to you and keywords that you can use to continue the conversation being highlighted in red during NPC lines. It allows the characters to feel a lot more like real people than just statues there to sell you things and give you info, especially with the new character portraits. Once you do pass the copy protection, Lord British gives you the rundown of what the heck is going on. He informs you that after the events of Ultima 5, the underworld that connected all the dungeons has essentially collapsed. And since then, these gargoyle creatures have been pouring out from the dungeons. Of course, the guards have been powerless to stop them. I mean, they probably couldn't really stop you either. So he asks you to solve all his problems for him as always. At least he gives you a room you'll never really use this time. And he asks you to talk to his court range and I still am the captain of the guard, Jeffrey. And that's really all you hear from him from the game. He doesn't really get much additional dialogue. So uh, I hope you enjoyed your brief conversation with Lord British. Jeffrey informs you that the gargoyles have occupied all of the shrines of virtue and that their latest attempt to reclaim one of them went disastrously. He asks that you seek out the survivors of that expedition and figure out how to free the shrines. When you talk to Nystal, he looks over a book that Yolo grabbed, which was the same book held by the priest in the intro sequence. He describes the cover as being kind of a flopped version of the game box, with a demon standing over a human instead of vice versa. But other than that, he says it is in an unknown tongue. He directs you to Mariah and Moonglow, who should be able to help you find out more. This sets you up with two different but concurrent paths to follow. You will spend this first main sequence of the game most likely going and freeing the shrines, which once completed will allow you to level up yourself and continue to progress through the game. The other is more of what ends up being followed for the main story, but in all likelihood you won't really start it until you've freed all the shrines and you probably won't want to until then. Now of course you are free to explore the castle, and if you haven't already done so, clean up on the gargoyle corpses in the throne room. This is a good time to learn your way about the interface. It does on the surface appear to be very similar in the interface of Ultima 3 through 5, with many nice VGA graphical upgrades making things easier to see, better distinguish, and make the world feel more alive and beautiful. As you would have noticed just in the beginning of your conversation, you get those neat new portraits when you were talking, if not horrifyingly ugly sometimes. <laughs> One large improvement, however, is the mouse support, which allows you to much more easily interact with the world. All of the commands you need to use are at the bottom of the screen now, from moving objects to using levers, talking, etc. But you can still use the keyboard shortcuts if you would like, which I often end up doing because not every icon is completely clear, and it just became second nature to hit M or T or whatever else in addition to a mouse click to decide what direction I want to use it. There's also a true inventory system for the first time ever, with each item in each character's inventory on a grid system in the top right area when you click on that character. Inventory management does become tedious eventually, however, partially because of how it is implemented, but also just because of the amount of stuff you acquire. As this was very early in the days of mouse support, you can't really just drag and drop stuff from the world to your inventory. To move anything, you have to use either the move or get command, select the item, and then click on the location you would like to move it to. Bags can help to declutter, but then you have to take extra steps to move it around because you have to first move it out of the bag into your inventory before moving it elsewhere. The way you interact with chests and other containers, such as dead bodies or bags, exacerbates this problem even more. Instead of opening up its own grid menu or something similar, 
when you look at a body or use a container in the world, everything gets dumped out in a huge stack right on top of that container, typically with the most useless items at the top. This means if you want everything or just a few items from it, you have to move or take the stuff on top first to get to everything at the bottom. And if you want to inspect a chest but leave stuff in it, you basically have to move everything out, take the stuff you want, and stick it back in and close the chest back up. Have fun moving around hundreds of axes and spears. The inventory management seems to be the thing that weighs down the interface the most, but a lot of it just feels kind of weird and hard to use. Partially, I think it has to do with some of the weird commands coming from the previous five games of Ultima, merging with a mouse-based brand new interface. You get used to the subtle difference between look and search, and the oddities of the use command or the move command, so it's not really that bad, but it could be a little unclear at first if you're used to just clicking or being given action prompts in modern games. Another thing that minorly bogs down the experience is kind of how crammed and small the view window feels. Even though it's about the same size as it has been before, it just kind of feels crammed in there for some reason. Maybe it's partially the upgraded graphics, maybe, I don't know, it's something else, but I don't know, it has always just felt kind of weird to me. But I got used to it over time. This is exacerbated at night, when the darkness makes it pretty much impossible to see beyond two to three tiles away. You will learn to love torches in this game really quickly. Even though it may seem like I hate this interface, it's really just these few quirks that kept me from getting very far into the game the first few times I tried it over the years. However, overall, it works. It's good. You are able to pick up and move just about anything in the world. This is critical, because there are many times where doors or ladders or items are hidden behind or underneath things. <laughs> it also helps solve one of the classic problems in video games, NPCs blocking your path. You can use the move command to move a person out of a doorway or a one wide passageway when they refuse to move with varied success. Sometimes it'll fail, but a lot of times this command will succeed even if it takes a few attempts and you will be able to get the person to move. This is awesome because it makes it so much easier to get through these small doorways or passageways which get clogged up because some friendly NPC just decided to stand right there. You also have much more freedom to equip characters, see stats, and move items around with the mouse rather than purely being a keyboard and text-based interface with a graphical representation, making it much more accessible and a significantly easier recommendation to people trying to get into this series than previous games. Overall, it is a large improvement, but it is not without its off-putting flaws. Once you leave the castle, you might as well set off trying to figure out how to free the shrines from the influence of the gargoyles. It's ends up being pretty much an identical process to the previous two games. Walk around each major city, asking for the mantra of virtue and where the appropriate rune is at. Luckily the mantras are all still the same as the previous two games, so you likely don't have to track those down if you still have your notes, or Google. When you do find out where a rune is, you'll probably have to do some sort of task for it to retrieve it. For example, you find out that the rune of valor was stolen by a rat and carried through a small hole in a tavern. No normal human can get inside there, but one of the wackiest party members in any RPG can. Sherry the Mouse. Yes, there is an available talking mouse companion who is required to beat the game who you can find in Castle British. And while she does start off extremely weak, you can level her up just like any other party member. And you better believe I got her strength way up and absolutely decked her out with heavy armor and weapons. Of course, you can also pick up human companions of all types including past companions from Ultima 4 and 5, including Yolo's wife, Gwenna. And Yolo and Gwenna have the same sprite for some reason, which always got me confused when I needed to just click on one of them. Speaking of leveling up, how you do so is tied to your quest to free the shrines. You need to pray to shrine with the appropriate rune and mantra and choose which companion you want to level up. Which stats you increase are tied to which shrine you pray at, and it is fairly intuitive if you understand the virtue system or you figure it out. Plus 3 to your strength, intelligence, and dexterity if you pray at the shrines of valor, honesty, and compassion respectively. Plus 1 to the two different stats at justice, sacrifice, and honor, based on which two principles create that virtue. Plus 1 to every stat at spirituality, and no stat boosts if you level up at humility? I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it's an option. Before you're allowed to level up though, the party member must have a certain number of experience points. The same as previous games, 100 to get to level 2, and doubling each level up. Each party member will have a different starting level of stats, so some have better potential while others start off much better. For example, some may start off at a level 4 or 5, which means they can only level up a few times, but they have higher starting stats. You can also just change party members as you go, so you're not locked into whoever you pick up early on. Intelligence affects magic points and magic, dexterity affects chance to hit, 
and strength, attack damage, and carrying capacity, while hit points are based on level. Inevitably, you're going to have to fight off some gargoyles and other creatures to advance your quest, as this is an RPG. It's very similar to previous games as you noted at the beginning. You will notice, however, that it is largely different from previous games, as instead of a transition between overworld exploration and combat, you choose when to go into combat and leave, and it's the same as the normal exploration screen. Because of this, that means that your party is in tow at all times, instead of it just being the avatar moving and talking to people. This means you can choose to disengage and engage in combat at will, and you're never forced into it. So all the encounters can be taken on as you wish. If you want the enemies might not really give you much of a choice. As part of this system is the new magic system. Gone is the old reagent mixing, binding scrolls, etc. system. Now you simply have a spell book. And while you do still buy scrolls from these merchants, once you simply use the move command to put them in your spell book, a particularly weird use of the move command, you have these spells permanently. At this point, there's only three requirements to cast them. One being of the appropriate level to cast the circle that that spell comes from. B, having enough mana and magic points to cast it, which is the same number of points as the circle. And C, the proper region says before, which can all be found in the manual. There are some really fun spells to be found, while some provided may make your game unbeatable, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't be tried. Similar to the seamless combat to exploration experience, the whole world is now a low transition experience. In previous games, you had a dual scale world system, where the general world was large tiles you traversed and cities and other areas were represented by a single tile sprite. You would then enter these areas, and the city would expand out for you to explore and navigate. If you entered a dungeon, you would be put into a 3D first person view to navigate and go between different rooms. With Ultima 6, that's all gone. Dungeons are entirely on a normal 2D plane, and the transition between cities and wilderness is effectively seamless. The overall world size, as far as tiles, had to be increased to accommodate this, but it feels just as vast and alive as ever, especially helped by the new graphics. Now you can see some NPCs travel between wilderness and city areas, and they seem to have much more complex schedules, going between bars, homes, and shops. Merchants will not sell to you unless they are in their shop. And they can be really picky about being behind the counter too, so if you just wait there and block them, you might have to move out of the way so they can get to their spot. And because of this, you can't just go buy supplies at 3am. One negative about the schedules, however, is that you can easily get into a situation where you arrive to talk to an NPC and it's the middle of the night. This wouldn't be a problem if you could easily wait till morning, but the only waiting you can do besides just holding down the spacebar is camping out, and you are not allowed to do that in cities. So you'll have to trudge out into the forest, camp out, and come back to find them. Or you can just drop something on the space bar and go heat up some food. Normally this is not really a problem, but sometimes you come crawling out of a dungeon in dire need of help from Lord British, and he just sleeps through your whole party entering the room, possibly causing you to die from a poison in the process. Again, I'm getting the impression he really doesn't care about me, he just wants me to take care of all his messes. On a more positive note, there are a lot more optional tasks to do. Optional dungeons, side quests, some frustratingly incomplete. I'm looking at you, Scar Brave Mystery, and many, many unique characters to talk to. The wacky and wild people that characterize the later entries in the series really start to come to life here, as you see not only the main quest, but also just talking to everyone and anyone. Honestly, the game is best experienced slowly, soaking it in instead of trying to speed through the main quest. If you just try to finish the main quest as possible, you'll honestly have a bad time, being underleveled for the things you want to see and do, and feeling like you've missed out on something. Of course, our favorite ever character, Smith the Horse, returns once again. Still permanently settled at YOLO's as since Ultima 5, he once again provides us the untimely advice to make sure to bring the sandalwood box to Lord British. Again, really could have used this about one game earlier, Smith. He also says he has a personal mission to keep the hay in Britannia at bay, lest it consume the realm. We salute you in your efforts, Smith. Stay strong. Of course, to get around this massive living world, you'll need some form of transportation. Walking will probably be about 90% of what you can do, but you can also grab a horse for quicker land transportation. I honestly forgot about this for pretty much my whole playthrough, so it's not really necessary. Ships are back, cannons and all, but they also bring with them two smaller boat types, skiffs and rafts. Rafts are basically one tile large craft that just follow the current no matter what you do and cannot go out past shallow waters, and thus really almost useless. Skiffs are almost identical, with the main difference being that you can actually control the direction that they travel. You will need to employ these crafts in several situations too, as many areas are really only accessible by traveling down a narrow river with mountains on both sides blocking land access. There are also more exotic modes of transport, 
Of course, the moon gates come back from the previous games, but they appear wherever the moon stones are buried. Each moonstone was trapped at a shrine before you liberate them from the gargoyles. This can be incredibly useful for getting into places that are not easily accessible by any means, or if you need to travel between a dungeon and the town very quickly. The other fully new moon gate travel method is the orb of the moons you received in the beginning of the game. To use the moonstone, you simply hit the use command and then select a tile to use it on. The position in relation to the avatar determines where this red moon gate will take you to, usually to one of the shrines or major cities of virtue. You can find out where all these locations go through experimentation, but a chart is provided in the strategy guide origin created for the game. There's also one more exotic mode of transport, but it relates to a major plot point that I will hit on later in the video. While you're exploring the intricate world, you will certainly notice the upgrade soundtrack. While there were several sound options, the most common card was probably the adlib, which is fully integrated with the sound blaster cards. Here are a few of the tracks. The game also supported the wonderful Roland MT32, a MIDI synthesizer that had become increasingly popular for game designers because it offered exceptionally high music quality. And oh, does it sound so good in this game. All of the sound effects are PC speaker and real hardware, but do come through of course in emulation. They aren't too bad as they are an awful audio level, but a few can be a little ear grating if heard over and over in combat for example. The other thing with the music is that the actual engine for deciding what music to play isn't perfect and sometimes a little jarring. The music is already a bit on the loud side with Adlib, so when you travel through Moongate and the music quickly switches from Stones to Royal Britannia, and then quickly to something else, it can be a bit jarring. Overall though, it is a welcome upgrade, especially for PC users finally being able to listen to the music, and all the tracks for later grade. Back to the main plot, after, or probably partly during, your journey to free all the shrines, you'll want to turn your attention to that book you're holding onto. If you go visit Mariah in the Lyceum on Moonglow as instructed, she will be able to give you a start. 
but not much. Turns out she has a small piece of a silver tablet that's kind of a gargoyle language Rosetta Stone. All she can make out is the title of the book Prophecy. She lets you know that she got her part of the tablet from a group of gypsies, who you will need to contact about the other piece. You will find this group of gypsies in Britannia. And yes, this group. There's another, but we don't, we don't talk about that group of gypsies. Anyways, these gypsies are led by a man named Zoltan, who informs you they were instructed to take the tablet to Mariah, but they were ambushed by a group of pirates who broke the tablet and took the large part of it. Of course we know about the city Buccaneers Den in Britannia, which... You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. When you get there, you naturally start asking around about Captain Hawkins and his crew who stole the tablet. People are pretty tight-lipped. You'll eventually find someone who seems to know something, but he refuses to talk to you unless you're a member of the guild and talk to a guy named Budo. Ah yes, more nested chores, the thing the Ultima series loves. I love to map out these games sometime and figure out how many layers do you get into doing tasks for tasks for tasks. Don't worry, Ultima 7 has this a lot more. Obviously, that's kind of a gist of most RPGs. You get a simple task that actually requires tons of sub steps and favors, but for some reason, the way in which the Ultima games tends to do this sticks out to me. I mean, I guess it's realistic because, you know, to get to a goal, you have to do lots of little things, which is kind of funny. For some reason, hidden behind the kitchen in the tavern, Budo has his Thieves Guild shop. He informs you that in order to join, you must have a Thieves Guild belt, but because there's only a limited number of belts, you must get one off of an existing member. Now, as interesting as it may be to do the detective work to find members and decide which one to eliminate or steal the belt from, Budo lets you know where to find a member they want, retired, at the bottom of the sewers in Britain. So underneath Lord British's castle, you find what will likely be your first real introduction to dungeons in this game. Gone are any of those first person segments, and it's all in that same transitionless format of the rest of the world, except the ladders between floors. And luckily you will find that with this new format, the dungeons are much easier to explore, and also have been cut down to four floors from the previous normal eight. This dungeon is mostly populated by rats, which while annoying and may poison you, don't provide much of a challenge in combat. Maybe just a good opportunity to grind some levels. The lady you are supposed to get the belt from, however, is well protected, with poison fields protecting her hideout and dual wielding glass swords. She is not hostile, but she refuses to give the belt to you, understandably. Here you will have the chance to do something wholly unavatar like, but also very fun. You can cast the pickpocket spell on her and take the belt off her, as well as both glass swords, which will surely help you out in your quest. While each of these castings cost you karma, we all know that karma is really just a number, and you have to do lots of unavatar like things at the beginning of the game before getting your karma back up. And remember, in the end... And the points don't matter, that's right, the points are just like how wrong your girlfriend is when you're having a fight with her. <laughs> that's right. Upon returning to Budo and getting a guild membership, Homer informs you that Hawkins buried the tablet with the rest of his treasure, and after his death, the remaining crew took the treasure map and tore it up, and they all went their separate ways. Thus starts the second third of the game, and probably the most tedious part. Homer is only able to tell you where a few of the crew members went off to, and you have to find them along the way. Of course, a lot of them were down and decided to go to the bottom of dungeons, get into shipwrecks, etc. The one that actually seems the most straightforward proves to probably be the hardest. The cook who ran off to Trinsic asks you to go to the bottom of Dungeon Dester, which is infested with dragons, just so you can get him a dragon egg so he can make some dragon egg omelet. He also tells you who the remaining crewmates are, so of course you can't really afford to delay his quest to be the last map piece either. Although most of these quests involve a lot of menial dungeon diving, there are some really cool parts. One of the simplest pieces reveals a dark secret, that the current mayor of Trinsic was previously a pirate on Hawkins' crew. He is horrified when you reveal to him that you know, and hands over the piece if you promise not to tell. It's small, but ultimately lends further to the feeling of life that you really get from the game, that these characters have pasts and histories that aren't just there for you. Once you've traveled the land and retrieved eight of the map pieces, you can return to Buccaneer's Den, where Homer will hand over the last piece which he's had this whole time, as well as detailed instructions to let you know exactly where to dig once you put it together. Unfortunately, no real X marks the spot. This becomes a small puzzle of how to lay the pieces out on the ground, but if you use the provided grid squares, it should become obvious fairly quickly. Homer revealed that the island in the upper left of the map is Buck's Den, and from there it should be fairly trivial to find the island, follow his instructions, and retrieve the prior treasure from the pirate cave. Make sure you grab the fan here as well, as that'll be useful later. Upon retrieval and return of the tablet to Mariah, she tells you of the contents of the prophecy. Essentially, a great evil will come to the land three times, known as the False Prophet. 
This evil would first take the Codex destabilizing their land, and then destroy the Underworld, and finally destroy their race. But you can't do this to me. I started this company. You know how much I sacrificed? Whoops. Apparently the only way to prevent this is the sacrifice of the Pulse Prophet. Okay, so two things. One is kind of a major retcon or at least very false blame stuck on the Avatar by the Book of Prophecy. In the intro to Ultima V, one of the big revelations is that after you were sent back to Earth since becoming the Avatar, the Great Council decided to lift the Codex from the Underworld and move it to its current location on the Isle of the Avatar, creating both the Isle of the Avatar and the Underworld Abyss. You have no real chance to steal it, as the moment you pass all of its tests, you were teleported back to Earth as far as we can tell from the game. The second big thing I realized when I got to this part is that as far as I can tell, that whole tedious process of completing the map, getting the tablet, is not actually necessary at all. While in the process of tracking down the map, you go seek after a crew member who sought to kill the demon Sinbral, who was incredibly helpful in your quest to defeat the Shadow Lords. As should be apparent by now, Sinbral is a gargoyle, and as he helped you before, when you find him alive and well, he's more than willing to talk to you about the situation on hand. While not as explicit and revelatory as what Mariah helps you find out, he tells you that the false prophet must sacrifice, that sacrifice may mean a few different things, and that you should head to the gargoyle world through the dungeon Hithloth to figure things out. Now Mariah does tell you to talk to him to get more info, and it's info you need to proceed, but as far as I know, this is all you need to know. <laughs> I don't want to go play back through the game right now to figure out if you can skip the whole map quest, but the fact that about a third of the main quest is basically only useful for a few lines of exposition that you can just figure out in the gargoyle world anyway, is kind of a major oversight. Also, the fact that Sinbral doesn't just read the book for you, as he sh should know Gargish, is a small plot rule as well. Well, all sequence break issues aside, taking his advice and descending Dungeon Hethloth, the party will discover a man named Captain John, alive and well, at the bottom. He knows much of the gargoyle world and culture. He gives us an introduction to the system of virtue, which was also derived from the Codex. And instead of the interlocking principles of truth, love, and courage, the gargoyles have the principles of control, passion, and diligence, which leads to their own similarly structured set of eighth virtues. Because the Britannian virtues are supposedly based on the Codex, it makes me think about how two different groups could derive two totally different systems of virtue and living from a single holy book, but I won't dig into that can of worms right now. Anyways, John gives you a scroll that provides the basic gargoyle vocabulary and refers you to a young gargoyle named Belem, who may be able to help you out. After meeting up with him and getting him into your party, he's able to take you to a scholar who won't attack you at sight and tell you more, who further refers you to Lord of Gargoyles to surrender. When you do give yourself up to Lord Drexensum, I, th I think that's how you pronounce it, he gives you the Amulet of Submission, which when worn will earn you the respect of all the gargoyles and allow you to speak to them freely. Once this gargoyle world is revealed to you, you learn a lot about them. Apparently there is a two-tiered culture, although it's not our real traditional classes to race struggle. Essentially, the winged gargoyles are the intelligent ones, genetically, with the ability to speak as well as to fly, and thus do the more involved and scholarly tasks. Consequently, those winged gargoyles who were unable to fly were considered as lesser, like our old friend Sid Brawl. On the other hand are the wingless, which while incapable of speech and relegated to basically farm labor, are taken care of by the winged ones and protected because of their ability to run in society by themselves. Richard Garrett himself has said that he did not seek for this to be an analog to any real world society or issue, but more as a completely alien culture that should be understood and dealt with on its own merits. As you talk with these gargoyles, you find that ultimately they don't hate you, especially since agreeing to the sacrifice, but really you're just spending for their survival. The whole war was more out of an inability to communicate and desperation with you in for dooming them instead of simply seeking to annihilate the humans. Of course, you still want to seek a resolution that doesn't involve you losing your life. So those alternate definitions of sacrifice that were mentioned may interest you. The Cyrenaic Saddler informs you that the Gargoyles believe in three kinds of sacrifice. Sacrifice of oneself, sacrifice of others, and of valuables. This advice he'll only give to you if you have high enough karma. So have that stealing and everything fixed by the tech get here. You obviously won't sacrifice yourself or anyone else if it can be avoided, and simply destroying and giving back the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom would upset one or both peoples. He does propose that you could return the Codex to the Void, however, which seems to be an amicable solution as it would make it accessible by both groups. To do this, you will need to overcome a few final obstacles. To even get into the Codex chamber, you must be on a spiritual quest. 
Since this time around, the shrine seemed to be incapable of providing this quest, unlike last game, you have to get one from the Shrine of Singularity in the Gargoyle Realm. Unfortunately, this shrine is only accessible through flight, as it is at the top of the mountains, and you somehow lost your grappling hook after Ultimate 5. You also will need to get two lenses made, one repaired by a lens maker of the Gargoyles, and one created by a glassblower. The lenses are very straightforward, but flight may prove much more challenging. However, Sinbrawl again leads us the right way, to Minoc, where apparently this hot air balloonist was very eager to talk about his adventures. Beh, al diavolo, I can't hold it in anymore. Ezio, I think I figured out how to make a man fly. <laughs> <sighs> Come on, I'll drive. When you eventually track him down after wandering a castle of monstrosities, he is dead, but his plans remain intact. One last journey around the land to get all the pieces assembled and created, and now you have a functional hot air balloon. You will quickly notice that you were just pushed about by the wind whichever way it is currently going. And unless you want to wait for the perfect wind or continually cast the wind change spell, you can use the magic band found amongst the treasure where the silver tablet was found. This will allow you to adjust the wind at no magic cost to be able to fly over the mountains and into the Temple of Singularity. Getting there, you can go right up to the big shrine, which will send you on a quest to their respective cargo shrines to learn about their system of virtue. You may also want to read the books contained in the shrine, as they will give you more insights into the gargoyle system and history. Upon arriving at these shrines, you will likely be shocked to learn that they have trapped the spirit of your first three foes, Mondane, Minex, and Exodus, in these respective shrines. Apparently they are trapped in these shrines because they represent one of the gargoyle principles taken to their extreme and not balanced by the other two. Each of these shrines gives you a mantra of one of the three principles, and combining them gives you the mantra of singularity, very similar to the word needed to complete the game in Ultima 4. Presenting this to the shrine gives you a spiritual quest so you can finally seek out the codex. The Codex of Ultimate Wisdom gives you final instructions you need to send it back to the Void. You must place the lenses between the Codex and the Flames, as well as using a Vortex Cube loaded with each of the eight Moonstones. After retrieving this cube from the old castle, now inhabited by friendly Cyclopses but little else, you must make sure you have all eight Moonstones. That means if you buried any of them from Moongate travel, you have to go get them all and dig them back up. Luckily, this being the end of the game means they will no longer be of use to you. But it is really annoying as you tend to have to travel to that location and then wait for a while before the gate disappears so you can pick up the stone. Also, if you somehow dropped it somewhere and left it without remembering where you put it, you're hosed without the cheat menu. As you won't ever be finding that sucker again, the world is just way too big. As much as I like how the ultimate means to hold your hand, being able to draw critical quest items is something I'm kind of glad is not a thing in the games anymore. Once you load up the cube and place the lenses, the closing cutscene rolls. Lord British, somehow knowing you sent the Codex to the Void, appears through a Moongate absolutely furious, as for some reason you never consulted him on his plan, but he doesn't really seem interested in anything you have to say throughout the game either. For as many issues as Ultima 9 has, at least Lord British actually cares about what happens during the story, unlike here where he only gets off his throne once you fix everything yourself. Anyways, you quickly explain the situation and hand him the human lens, which reveals a closed Codex of the Void. <laughs> Immediately after, the Gargoyles Moongate in as well, grabbing a lens and revealing the open codex for both races to read only if they can cooperate. Apparently this is a good enough solution despite literal ages of bloodshed between these two people, and you're given a congratulatory screen before unceremoniously being dumped to the DOS prompt. I guess you return to Earth, it's not really stated unlike the previous two games, but it's implied. And this is Ultima 6! Finally I was able to beat this game that I've been chipping away at slowly for the better part of a year. I did overall enjoy the experience. And after starting this game on and off for years, I was finally able to break through my initial turnouts with the other interface, etc., and be able to really see everything this masterpiece has to offer. Although not my favorite in the Ultima series, and maybe a bit more difficult than it deserves, it's still one of the best CRPGs I've ever created, and deserving of a playthrough by anyone and everyone willing to pick it up despite its age. Ultima 6 is the conclusion of the second trilogy of Ultima games, also known as the Age of Enlightenment. From here, we will see the series undergrow a lot of branching out, evolution, and massive changes before coming burning crashing to the ground, and this will all be reflected in any videos. I have reviewed one spin-off game much earlier, though Mount Drash is anything but official Ultima, but now we'll see the spin-offs back and forth. Between Ultima 6 and 7, there's not just one, but three major spin-offs games, two based on the Ultima 6 engine and an entirely new first-person dungeon crawler. I will be reviewing all of these, hopefully with a much faster turnaround than the previous ones with my new setup and everything else. Thanks so much to everyone who's waited out my awful video release schedule, and those who are watching my channel for the first time. If you've gotten this far, you must really want to hear what I have to say, 
or are preparing paragraphs in the comments to roast me. This video was a big first for me as it was my first Ultima video recorded on my 486 machine, which required a substantial investment into upscaling another video on audio hardware to get it to work. It's still not perfect, but I'm hoping that I can perfect this to be able to provide y'all with the most authentic and nice video of games for everyone to watch. If you like this and want to see others, I have a whole playlist of Ultima and game reviews, and make sure to like and subscribe to let me know I should get my act together to make things faster. Thanks so much, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.